Okay, here's our video. The story of Jupiter versus the brown dwarf. And let's get our pen ready here. And you can see Jupiter in the corner over there. Right over here. And then we have this low mass star. And the low mass stars are red dwarfs. And you might be asking, well, they don't look red. Well, red dwarf stars can appear yellow, white, or red. They have um, a very low temperature compared to our sun, but they will last a much, much longer than our sun. And they're, they're the most common uh, stars in the galaxy, in the universe. So between a uh, low mass star, which are red dwarfs, and you know, we'll just name it, we'll name it Proxima Centauri, because Proxima Centauri is our closest star. Here's Proxima Centauri. It's some, some 4.2 light years away. Fix that G there. All right, so that's Proxima Centauri, let's say. And over here, of course, we have Jupiter, our largest planet. And then we have a brown dwarf. And let's call this, we're going to call it Gliese. We'll call it Gliese. Because that was the first brown dwarf that they discovered and we'll put it over here, in, in 1995, they discovered the brown dwarf for the first time. And it's actually called Gliese 229b. There is a Gliese 229a, which is actually a red dwarf. All right, so far, so good. And when, when we look at Gliese 229b, we'll just call it Gliese, it's anywhere between 20 to 50 times greater than Jupiter. 50, oh, the mass, that is. The mass of Gliese 229b is about 20 to 50 times greater than that of Jupiter. So before we begin, well, we actually have begun, but we should know what planets are and what stars are, and that might clear things up. So let's change the color. We'll use red up. And over here, we'll just say what a planet does compared to a star. So a planet or what it doesn't do. So a planet will not, it will not emit light. So the only times we see planets is because they reflect light, right? We know the moon reflects light from the sun. That's why we see the moon. That's why we see all the planets. So a planet will not emit light, but we know, put over here, here, stars will. Stars will emit light. That's one thing we can see in a difference. But here's an important one. Planets, very important one, will not, very important, let's put a box around, will not. They will not go through nuclear fusion. They will not go through nuclear fusion. That's what's happening in stars. It's even happening in brown dwarfs for a time. So what is nuclear fusion? It's the fusing together of atoms. In this case, it's the fusing of hydrogen. It's happening in all these stars into helium. To helium, right? So H to HE, those are the symbols. So let's get a clean page here and let's, let's explain that a little further. All right, so in our sun, Right, we'll have it's fusing four hydrogen atoms. It's been doing this for five billion years. So we have these. This is all the hydrogen atoms, and they're fusing together to create helium, and that creates energy. In case the energy we need for life on Earth. Now, in our sun, uh, eventually, when all the hydrogen runs out in the core, it will expand into a red giant, and then eventually it'll will fuse helium, put the helium over here, into carbon. So our sun will do that. And in greater, in more massive stars out there, they can even keep the fusing going into iron. And you can go from to a neutron star or a black hole. But our sun will never become a neutron star or a black hole. It'll eventually become a white dwarf. And I have videos on that. Okay, but in a brown dwarf, what happens is you do get this fusion happening. You do not get that happening. You know? So hydrogen will fuse to helium in a brown dwarf. And I'll explain that in a minute. So again, we can say that Jupiter, some scientists say Jupiter is a failed star. But 
But actually, Jupiter is more a failed dwarf, a failed brown dwarf. We could say brown dwarfs are failed stars. They don't have enough mass to create this fusion process. So when you think of stars, again, you can also think of stars as nuclear reactors. Planets are not. All right now, as we go, let's go back to our comparison over here. So we did say, and let's go back to green. So we did this, say this was Proxima Centauri, our closest star, besides our sun. And then we said this was Gliese. This was Gliese, the brown dwarf, and of course we know that's Jupiter. So if we and just basically to know, you know, we can say a brown dwarf is between a star and a planet, the brown dwarfs went through nuclear fusion, but they it stopped. Nuclear fusion stopped. And now they have a kind of stable core. Their core is held up by electron degeneracy, which I'll explain in a minute. So basically what's happening is the nuclear fusion stopped again in the brown dwarf. Our sun, our sun will stop fusing hydrogen in the future, like I said previously. But then as it becomes a red giant, it will fuse helium into carbon and eventually becomes a white dwarf. So if we look at the temperatures, we'll write the temperatures over here. So for a brown dwarf, brown dwarfs can reach temperatures anywhere between, let's say, 2,800 Kelvin to and below. They can reach maybe 300 Kelvin. So if we're looking at that temperature range, let's put it in Fahrenheit, they can be 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and they could even go down to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, 80 degrees is fine for us, right? But for a star, that's extremely cold. So if you think about our sun, right? Our sun has temperatures, and we'll use Fahrenheit, maybe 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're talking at the surface. Whereas Proxima Centauri, they can reach 5,100 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you look at Proxima Centauri and Gliese, their temperatures are not far away from each other, right? So Gliese, though, know, it doesn't have the mass to become a star because the nuclear fusion has stopped. Let's look at the temperatures. Proxima Centauri, by the way, is about 500 times less bright than our sun. Of course, we're saying that the, the largest brown dwarf would have these temperatures, so we're not sure if Gliese has those temperatures. They're probably much, much lower than the 4,500 temperatures. So here, let's get our pen growing. What should we use? I'll use yellow. So when they're looking for red dwarfs, because they're hard to detect, because they don't have the luminosity. But when they're looking for them, sometimes they look for lithium. And we'll put that over here. They're looking for lithium, which I'm sure a lot of you know about. We try to use it in our EVs, our electric vehicles. And the thing about stars like our sun is we destroy lithium in the hydrogen fusion uh, process. So if you find lithium in a planet, and, or what you think is a planet, it may be a brown dwarf. And they did find last year in 2021, they did find lithium in this um, object. And they call it Reed 1B. So we'll call it, it's Reed 1B. Reed 1B. So they found this lithium. And they uh, do know that Reed 1B is the oldest so far oldest and coldest oldest and coldest brown dwarf that they have found so far not the oldest not the first one they found but the oldest that's out there and they think it's about one million years old which is extremely young extremely young of course it could be older now because of the way light reaches us just think of our our star itself is over 4 billion years old. So 1 million years old is young. And they think it's about 41 times the size of Jupiter, mass of Jupiter. 41 times the mass of Jupiter. Mass of Jupiter. And when they think about the coldness, they think it's reaching 171 degrees Fahrenheit is hot for us, but cold for a star. And by the way, in, in Gliese 229b, the one we were talking about, they did detect methane in its composition. 
And also the Gliese 229B uh, is circling another red, red dwarf called Gliese 229A. It's a low mass star. It's a red dwarf. And here's another comparison. Here's Gliese 229A. We talked about companion to Gliese 229B. Gliese 229B is a red, oh, Gliese 229A is a red dwarf, where Gliese 229B is a brown dwarf. And of course, you can't really look at this picture because it looks like Jupiter is even bigger than Gliese 229B. So don't go by this picture. And let's just also mention Teta. I get our pen going over here. Teta over here was actually the first verified brown dwarf in 1995. So Gliese 229B was the first one that they found, but they actually verified Teta first. You can see the size of Teta compared to Gliese 229B. Now let's let's turn to Jupiter in our story. And here's a picture of inside an artist rendition of what could be inside Jupiter. And right here you're seeing an ocean of metallic hydrogen. So this is hydrogen. Say liquid hydrogen. Get our pen going over here. Liquid hydrogen. Liquid H, right? Because we know H is hydrogen. And Jupiter. We know what Jupiter looks like, right? So Jupiter, just like our sun, it has hydrogen and helium, but it's not fusing it. Remember, planets don't fuse hydrogen into helium. They're not nuclear reactors like brown dwarfs. So the enormous pressure on Jupiter and the temperature will compress hydrogen into a liquid, as you're seeing here. And that liquid, that liquid metallic hydrogen, is very conductive. So as you can see, these lightning bolts all around. And because it's very conductive, I mean, it is creating an enormous magnetic field that's going up into Jupiter. Now, maybe maybe one day we'll be able to send a probe, but so far when we send probes into Jupiter, the pressure is so enormous, they, they destroy the probe. So maybe one day we'll be able to view this liquid hydrogen ocean. All right, and the last thing we want to talk about is what I told previously. I was talking about electron degeneracy pressure right over here, electron Degeneracy, use a capital D. And this is what's holding up a white dwarf and a brown dwarf. The brown dwarf doesn't have enough mass to become a white dwarf, but a white dwarf, if, and that's what's keeping a white dwarf, and a white dwarf doesn't have enough pressure to become a neutron star. But basically, um, I'm just going to draw a diagram. This basically what's happening is that you have, let's say, all these are electrons. And remember, electrons don't want to be in the same orbital. According to Pauli's exclusion principle, sounds like all these big words we're using, the Pauli exclusion principle, and I'll do it in simple terms, it's basically stating no two electrons want to uh, occupy the same orbital, not the same cloud, but the same orbital. So basically, with it was just in a simple terms, is all these electrons, they're moving away from the lower level orbitals because they want to fill higher levels because of that exclusion principle. So they keep getting into higher and higher states, and they're putting this pressure on gravity. So gravity, we'll use another color for gravity. We'll use we'll use green, right? So gravity is pushing the core this way. Whereas the electron energy is pushing the opposite way. And so it kind of stabilizes, keeps this balance. It keeps the core intact. That's basically what's happening here. Now, if it gets, there's too much mass and too much pressure, eventually gravity will win out. And when that happens, you can create a black hole. But again, brown dwarfs, white dwarfs, our sun, they don't have enough mass for that to happen. So again, simple terms. This electron degeneracy pressure is halting gravity's ability to collapse the core. Again, very simple. Let's go back to the let's go back to the picture. All right. And so again, like we said, Gliese. Gliese is a failed star. It's a brown dwarf. It went through fusion. It had nuclear fusion going on, but it stopped very early on. Jupiter is a planet. It had no nuclear fusion. It's a failed brown dwarf. 
And we did say low mass stars are red dwarfs, which are the most common stars in the galaxy. And we did say the low mass star of Proxima Centauri, and of course our sun, which in 5 billion years from now will become a red giant because it will fuse, it will end, you know, the hydrogen will uh, stop fusing and then the helium will now take control of and fuse into carbon. All right, that's our video today.